Jeff, it has been an extremely long and dramatic day for this jury, a day that included a public courtroom outburst from the defendant, Brian Fitch. Closing arguments in the case against Brian Fitch were full of drama. There was Dakota County Prosecutor Phil Prokopowitz waving Fitch's gun in its plastic evidence bag, quote, this is the murder weapon. This is the gun that killed Scott Patrick. Prokopowitz finished his 95-minute summary of the facts by telling jurors, quote, the time has come for justice to be served. The time has come to, quote, return verdicts of guilty. <laughs> Fitch's defense team responded, playing the audio of the dramatic shootout between Fitch and police on July 30th. Attorney Laurie Traub took 45 minutes to point out possible reasonable doubt in the state's case. There's a, quote, huge gaping hole in their timeline, she argued. What is the actual defense? Is it a lesser charge? Is it I was drug dealing, I wasn't trying to kill anybody, or is it an alibi defense? What is the actual defense? Well, there, there is no defense in the sense that there's an alibi or there's an alternative shooter. The only thing that, uh, that came out was every time a witness came up, the defense tried to poke holes in their story. Mm -hmm. You know, there's uh, DNA evidence on the gun, but there's no fingerprint on the mm -hmm. gun. Um, in terms of the, the timeline. She brings a lot of attention to that. They, she talks about the fire, the, the, when I say she, Lori Traub, a defense attorney, she, she suggests that uh, uh, firearms uh, science that puts the murder weapon that Brian Fitch has in his right. vehicle, that there's doubt about the science, that you know they don't shoot multiple guns to see if the same bullets would match up. So I just think she went out and just, it felt to me like this trial was all about if we have the right guy and it is Brian Fitch, has the state, has the prosecution done enough to legally sort of confirm that? I don't think there's mm -hmm. any doubt of a who done it. There's no suggestion someone else might have been behind the wheel. There's just doubt she's trying to create Lloyd Traub at every turn. This was something of a bombshell that not a lot of people saw coming, at least certainly not publicly, to end week two of this trial. For the first time, the defense offering up a potential alternate theory, an alternative motive, and potentially, quite possibly, a different killer. While cross-examining prosecution witness, St. Paul Police Sergeant John Wright, Jeffrey Trevino's defense attorney introduced the photo of items that were found in Kira's purse inside her car at the Mall of America after she went missing. Inside that purse was a small bag of marijuana. John Connard asked the sergeant if he knew where Kira got the drugs. He did not. Then he asked if drug dealers and drug houses can be dangerous. The sergeant said yes. The court then recessed for the weekend with this marijuana drug use issue hanging in the air. Certainly a possible alternate theory for the defense just as they are about to get the case. From that back corner bedroom, it is about 20 full paces down this long, narrow hallway to make it here to the basement stairwell. This is where the tragic events would unfold. Was it cold-blooded murder or self-defense in these tight quarters? There's a bullet hole there. There's one down there. The stairs down are narrow. Cousins Nick Brady and Haley Kiefer could not possibly have seen Smith off to their hard left. His reading chair, mere feet away, obscured between two bookcases. Byron loves to read. Look at all the books. That was his reading chair. That wasn't his all, deer stand. No, that was not his deer stand. His defenders, including another friend and neighbor, John Lang, remained convinced Smith had to shoot to kill, fearing the teen intruders might be armed and scared out of his mind following a rash of prior break-ins. If I was hiding a gun here, bang, he's dead. Here's the interior basement room where Smith would drag the bodies. Through another door, his workshop and the surveillance monitors for the four cameras he hung around the house. If he was watching these screens on Thanksgiving Day 2012, he would have seen the teens casing the home for some 12 minutes, readying to break in. I would have done the same thing. I, I would have been terrified. Jurors needed just three hours to convict first-degree murder. But Smith's defense team, led by attorney Steve Meshbesher, insists the jury didn't get the whole story. They're asking the Minnesota Supreme Court to toss out the verdict and grant a new trial. Paul, you covered this trial from the very beginning. You heard all of the evidence, the eerie uh, recordings and everything else that went on inside that home. Was it unnerving to be there? It, it was a little uncomfortable to be inside, Jeff, I have to say. But what was interesting to me, again, jurors didn't get a chance to see, but I talked to Steve Meshbasher tonight. I kind of thought that the defense might have gotten a little bit of a benefit to see that house. You would have seen how Byron Smith lived, almost a hermit-like existence, the tight quarters, and how much fear he could have had. I'm not saying it would have made a difference. There was a ton of evidence against him. I just think perhaps the defense may have benefited from jurors actually seeing this with their own eyeballs. Mm. All right. Thanks, Paul. You got it.